So on the news and on social media, you've probably seen a lot of claims that a log4j worm is coming. And when it comes, it's gonna cause all kinds of problems. It's gonna be the worst case scenario and that we need to do everything to avoid it. And it's been a couple of weeks now and you're probably wondering, well, where is this log4j worm? So I'm gonna explain why it's, it hasn't happened yet and why it's unlikely to happen. Or if it does, it's not going to be as big of a deal as people think. So to understand first, you need to understand why worms are made. And there are typically two reasons. There is the very old reason is back in the 80s and 90s, it was considered impossible to scan the entire internet. If you wanted to scan the internet, what you would do would, write, would be write software that infects a computer and then uses that computer to scan other computers and then the computers it infects uh, scan other computers and it just branches out and branches out until you have potentially uh, tens of thousands of computers all scanning the internet. But in these modern times, you can buy a server with a 10 g a gigabit line and you can scan every IP address on every port in a matter of hours, maybe even minutes. So that is like not really a thing that needs to happen anymore. Those old fashioned worms where you were using the power of the worm to scan just aren't needed anymore. Now, the second reason to have a worm is because you have a lot of devices that are connected to the local network, but not connected to the WAN or the, the internet. Uh, this was the case with uh, WannaCry and not Petya. The, uh, the SMB server, which uh, the vulnerability affected SMB, and the SMB server might be connected to the internet, but all of the computers on the network would have been behind a firewall or NAT or whatever. So what would happen is the virus would hit the SMB server from the internet and then spread within the network from there. And that was the only way it could reach those systems that were not directly connected to the internet. But log4j is a lot different to Eternal Blue. Eternal Blue was a protocol vulnerability. It affected the SMB protocol, which is the protocol that both the clients and the servers on a, window net, on a Windows network speak. Whereas log4j is not a protocol vulnerability, it is not an application level vulnerability, it is a library vulnerability. And what this means is the code is actually in a library and how that library is used depends on the application developer. It's a logging library, so it could be I'm logging HTTP requests, I'm logging IRC messages, I'm logging really anything. So in order to exploit the vulnerability, you need to know how the application is going to log things. And the current method is via HTTP. A lot of HTTP applications might log user agents or OAuth tokens, or even just regular old GET requests. So what people have been doing has been putting the exploit string in basically every field of a HTTP request and then sending that to the server. And that's been moderately successful. We did a scan and found about, I'd say something about 10,000 uh, devices that appeared vulnerable. But 10,000 is a lot less than the potentially millions of applications that are using log4j. So that's where this worm idea meets a bit of a problem, is in order to exploit all the applications that log, uh, use log4j, you would need to implement all, uh, exploits for all of those logging capabilities. And they're gonna vary from applications to application. For instance, in Minecraft, the exploit was done via putting a chat message in the chat box because most servers will log all chat messages. And then you have the HTTP exploitation and all kinds of different methods of exploit. And for a worm to be effective, it would need to implement potentially hundreds, maybe even thousands of different exploit methods in order to reach the, the log4j library through whatever protocol the application speaks. And then you have client and server-side applications. Currently, the exploit only affects server-side applications because it's targeting HTTP servers. Uh, in order to exploit the client, you would need to somehow get between the client and the server, possibly via a man-in-the-middle attack, which would be completely dependent on whatever protocol the client and server speaks. So realistically, it's not actually practical at all to make a worm which would affect all implementation, uh, implementations of log4j. 
and the current implementation which the uh, exploit is using, which is the HTTP method, can already be done via a scanner. You can scan the entire internet and exploit every single device with that method in about a minute with a 10 uh, gbits line. So there is no need for a worm. And as for like offline systems that are only co uh, connected via the LAN, there isn't guaranteed to be a huge amount. If someone has a externally facing log4j server, then maybe they have some other devices on the network that are internally facing only. But what exactly is the purpose of infecting these? If you're doing something very CPU intensive or resource intensive like Bitcoin mining, then sure, the more devices, the better. But for anything actually damaging, such as ransomware, there's just no value to infecting these internal facing devices. Ever since WannaCry happened, ransomware has moved from this, let's try and spread to all of the systems and ransom them, to let's hit one system within the network and, and manually compromise the rest of the network and then ransom absolutely everything from client PCs to servers to backup devices, you name it, they will just hit everything on the network. And that is the best way for them to get paid. So infecting one, maybe two, maybe three log4j servers within a network, encrypting those and leaving everything else untouched, that's just not gonna do the same kind of damage as manually going in and compromising the entire network, which attackers are already using log4j to do, which in my opinion was the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is attackers using a single vulnerable host to get into your network and then compromising the entire network. So a log4j worm is maybe valuable to someone who wants to do crypto mining or maybe just make a botnet for glory and, and show off. But in terms of actual sophisticated actors who have the capabilities to make a worm, there just isn't any reason to do so. So you have this disparity with people who could make a worm don't want to because there's very little value in it, it's noisy, it attracts a lot of attention that they don't want. And then you have the people who do want the noise and they do want the attention, but they don't have the capabilities to develop one. And worms are rare. We have seen probably the most recent worm was not Petya, which came shortly after WannaCry, which also was a worm. But these were not things that just any old garden variety attacker just made. These were using an exploit that was ready to go leaked from the NSA and then picked up by other nation states. And NotPetya was believed to have been the Russian state uh, waging cyber warfare against Ukraine. And WannaCry was the North Korean state trying to make money to fund their nuclear weapons program. These were not just your standard threat actors who just pop up and, wrote, and write worms. These were nation states with very specific goals. And in the case of WannaCry, that didn't work out. Even if the attack had not been stopped, they probably would not have made that much money. So these things are not things that, oh, there is an exploit, so there's gonna be a worm. People were saying there would be worms for Blue Keep, uh, Deja Blue, the exchange exploits, and we never saw worms for those because simply worms are very, very specific tools for very specific goals that just don't arise often. So we probably will not see one for Log4j, and if we do, just the nature of the vulnerability means it's probably not gonna cause a huge amount of damage. It's just gonna be one of those gimmicky things where some script kitty infects a bunch of devices and is like, wow, look what I can do. And it's by no means the worst case scenario. In fact, the worst case scenario probably has already happened.